Hello and welcome to the Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farron, co-owner of the company Horns of Odin. And join, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, today we have a really interesting guest. We have Jack Donovan, the author of The Way of Men. Um, on our podcast, we're going to talk with Jack about um, basically using the past as a way to, um, you know, becoming a man. Um, we're going to talk about masculinity, of course, in context of uh, Scandinavia. But uh, Jack, as I understand you, you're also uh, you're a little broader than simply just you know uh, Germanic Scandinavia. You're 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 focused on sort of more the Indo-European background. Um, but uh, nonetheless, welcome to the show. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. All right, th- thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, a lot of fun conversations for us to to have. Sure. So yeah, let's <laughs> let's get the uh, the ugly stuff out of the way first, I guess, because as as we're kind of getting ahead of the curve, we assume that when we put this out, we're probably going to get some negative comments, as you're probably the most controversial guest we've had so far. Um, and I guess that's the some people call you right wing, some people call you all all right. And just want to give you a chance, in you know, in your own words, to kind of say what you've got to say about that, and then we can put that to bed and. And move on to the masculinity side of stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, as you said, internet will say I'm a bad man. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, as when I wrote the Way of Men, I was uh, obviously looking at masculinity and saying, "What is masculinity about? And what do I what 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 defines masculinity? What do uh, men care about?" And one of the main the, the main thesis of that book was that the way of men is the way of the gang and that uh, men actually select each other. And a lot of el- evolutionary psychologists actually miss that. But if you do in the, in the way that men select each other for a football team, and then the foot guys on the football team, get the girl uh, it's very much the same uh, concept. If you think about it, because if you didn't, you couldn't pull your own weight in a uh, band of men who were struggling to survive, you aren't worth a lot as a man. And so men have always cared what other men think, thought about them because they had to from a survival perspective. And that's most of our evolutionary history. And so uh, the way of men is the way of the gang. And I start, you know, obviously going down this uh, thought process. I'm like, well, what is tribe? What are my people? You know, like what, you know, who am I? Where do I fit in? What are my people? Whatever. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I looked into that in a lot of different ways. And uh, so, yeah, I, I looked into like, you know, race and, and culture and all that kind of stuff. I mean, a lot of people, when I first started writing about it, it was more like the West, you know, uh, yeah. it, it was, you know, and so uh, you're like, well, what is my real heritage? And that's why, I mean, really a lot of people, I think, get into, uh, you know, whether they're, you know, you know Scandinavian religion in, in some way or Germanic religion or any of these other ones, a lot of them are interested in their heritage. Mm-hmm. And so that becomes a, an issue. And then, so uh, when I wrote The Way of Men, uh, yeah, obviously a lot of people who were also interested in a lot of the different, the same ideas, uh, were interested in my work. And I've always been of the mind, kind of a Hunter S. Thompson, uh, kind of character in the sense of like, well, I can talk to all kinds of people with all kinds of different ideas. And, uh, that's actually the America where I grew up in. Uh, we don't really live in that world right now uh, because people live in a world of gossip. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so like, if you hang out with one person, then you believe everything that they've ever believed in their entire life. And, uh, you know, I don't believe what I believed three years ago or five years ago or whatever. Uh, you know, people want to put me in a box, like say, Hey, you're this or that or whatever. Uh, I, I also voted for John Kerry, the democratic candidate in San Francisco with my Mexican boyfriend. So what what box would you what period of my life are we talking about that that puts me into where you know uh, who this guy is but anyway yeah obviously i spoke at some alt right events i spoke at some uh uh identitarian events in europe which is, europe i think is a different thing i don't even deal with that cuz i don't know what's going on there i don't speak the languages i you know if they want to publish my books i'm like cool mm-hmm. you know like you're going to pay to publish my books that's great I don't know what you're publishing and I, there's no way I can judge it because I don't speak German and Italian and all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, uh, and, uh, obviously the next thing, well, the, the next uh, sin that I've done 
is that I, uh, you know, I was in a folkish heathen group. And obviously in the world of heathenry and Odinism and, and, uh, and all this, and Asatru and all that, there's, you know, there's kind of this folkish camp and there's, you know, like a universalist camp. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I jo- joined a folkish group. Now, was it, you know, it, was it a uh, hate group that was excited about going out and hurting other people? No, and that we never talked about that. Uh, but it was limited because it was people concerned about their heritage. Uh, I'm not part of that group anymore. Uh, it didn't work out. And actually I found that personally very limited. And as, uh, as Matthias said, uh, at the beginning of the uh, podcast, uh, you know, I'm looking to broaden my perspective because when I wrote the way of men, I wrote about, you know, I used the Epic of Gilgamesh and I used the, the story of Rome and I used all these things to talk about these things that are important to men everywhere, all around the world, no matter what race they are, no matter what culture and whatever. And right now that's kind of what I'm working on is I'm kind of going back to my roots because I felt very limited by only being able to deal with people who were into, you know, this Germanic thing. We're only people into the Scandinavian thing. We're only people into this or that. And, uh, I want to, I just want to deal with excellent guys and, uh, who, who are care about excellence and, and strength and all the other ideas that I talk about. So uh, I'm more interested in the, in the principles that unify them. And so that's what I'm writing about now. And that's what I care about now. No, oh, perfect. And, you know, I feel, I feel awkward that you even had to kind of go through that. But, we, you know, like you say, we live in this world where people do put people in boxes. And as soon as we release the episode, you're going to get a certain group of people who are going to automatically see your name and assume things. And I think it helps. Oh, yeah. It helps all around that we can just say, look, listen to the first six minutes of the show. And that will explain kind of, where we're at and you know you like it or you don't like it and you know like you said yourself people change people change their opinions people change their minds and i worry more about the people who refuse to change their minds on things and always stick with the same opinions for for 30 years they're the people i worry more than somebody who says you know what did that this isn't for me so now i do this or i did that i've learned from that so now i do something else and they're you know they're the people who are willing to learn and change and and they're the kind of, for me, the, the more trustworthy people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can't admit you're, you're ever wrong or that you ever made a mistake or that you ever, you know, that your ideas are evolved, I mean, you're actually not a thinker. Uh, Absolutely. You know, you're, not, you're, you're, yeah. you're, not, you're not a conscious person. You're mm-hmm. not self-aware. And, yeah. uh, you know, or you're just doubling down. And people do this too. They'll just double down on a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, of course. And they never let it go. You know, and that's, mm-hmm. and that's terrible too. And, and, you know, the people who would make these comments, I always wonder, like, are they, you know, I don't do that. I don't go out and be like, you, you talk to a bad person once, yeah. you know, you know, like who does that? Like, it's just gossip. It's like a way to feel better than somebody without actually doing, accomplishing anything in life. So yeah. uh, anyway, so let's go to the good stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we say good stuff, but Mateus, obviously we had a, a little bit of feedback from our last episode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, we, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so what, what was it? We were called uh, 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 liberal lib- Jewish cucks and stuff like that, that for that's, that's the last the episode that we had. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that was, that was amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, for anybody so, who hasn't no- listened to the last episode, it was the, the one where we had a conversation about whether or not the, the possibility of there being homosexual Vikings and some people didn't like that idea and decided to to call us liberal Jewish cooks yeah and pushing an ideology and I don't know what um, yeah no that was a, that was interesting um, obviously one of the things that came out of that conversation that we had with Amy last time was actually that we wanted to to hear and that's why we you know have invited you on the show Jack. Uh, we wanted to hear about masculinity as 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 a concept in in and of itself in that context. So yeah, um, where should we start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I guess the obvious link for me, because like I say, a lot of the a lot of the negative comments came directly to me through the business page. So the the, the comments that we were picking up on, I guess, were, you know, how can how can there be gay Vikings when kind of like you are quote-unquote effeminate if you are gay so how can you be the kind of this big brute masculine 
a Viking going around, and, and I, some people even said, you know, they were known for their raping, and you know that was that was kind of thrown at us a lot. So I guess the obvious question, you know, as you said, Jack, before you've you know you've got your, your a Mexican boyfriend, you're not you don't ha- you don't hide that, you know. So so, but also anybody watching watching the video podcast can also see that you are kind of a pinnacle of masculine man. You know, you you are not the stereotype effeminate, effeminate male that you know these people are quoting so i want to get your opinion on how on the way that they were looking at it, this idea of that a gay man couldn't be a viking because they are not masculine well first of all i would think it was very interesting and i don't think this is necessarily the case but i would think it was very interesting if the people who were mad about potential racism were okay with uh saying that all homosexuals are effeminate. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be interesting that they're doing the same thing. Now, whether they're two different groups, a- again, like I said, you have two different groups in that world. Uh, one is very accepting and the other one is is very like, well, you're a liberal Jewish cuck. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I get all those emails. And that's why, I mean, honestly, uh, the, the white nationalists and all those people, uh, I, I hate them more than anyone at this point because mm-hmm. I get more shitty email from them than anybody else. Uh, like, you know, like the far left, like leaves me alone compared to the far right. Uh, you know, they, they're just, they're just angry, shitty people. So you, you, but, so, uh, you're, kind <laughs> of, you're kind of stuck in the middle, hated by both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that means that you're doing something right. Uh, you know, like <laughs> yeah. thinking, but, uh, you know, as, as far as, uh, let's see, as far as they're being, uh, you know, homosexuality, masculinity, and the possibility of that existing, well, uh, of course it did. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is that uh, historically, and I've I obviously put a lot of study into this at a per- certain time in my life. Uh, historically, there's probably always been in every culture, everywhere, there's a very small percentage of homosexuality that happens. It's, it's a, just a recurring thing. It's like in the way that there are different personality traits that come out everywhere over and over again. And some person, people are like this and some people are like that. And some people are like that. Uh, it's, we don't really know why, but it, it is a thing that happens. And uh, what's funny is the idea that it couldn't be uh, Vikings would be like, uh, actually sailors have a pretty big reputation for that in the world. <laughs> oh, uh, I, you know, like, so we, we actually suggest, <laughs> we, we suggested that one, that was one of the sticking points that a lot of people kind of attacked us for as well was this, well, how dare you say that these, these, this war band of people just because they hung out together, it made them all gay. And it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. What? It didn't make them all gay, but I think that, you know, Bjorn and, and Thor, you know, have been on a boat for nine months and you're like, hey, hey, hey how you doing, Bjorn? You know, like, like, like I, 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 did it ever happen? Sure, it probably happened. Was it a social norm? Probably not. Uh, you yeah. know, because I think that that happens more often in very cosmopolitan areas because you have a very small percentage of the population that has a that is different in some way and in a very big city they can all find each other Mm -hmm. but you know if you have small country towns and whatever you're not going to have a bunch of that or you know dude is going to make a a messed up move and everybody in the town's you know maybe going to burn him you know like or something you know like Mm -hmm. then it's you know if if he makes the wrong move because that's, you know, like you can overstep Absolutely. in that world, yeah. obviously. And, uh, and so that could be a problem, but you know, in more cosmopolitan areas, I mean, that's why, you know, and obviously it was a thing in ancient Greece, uh, you know, but I, I've always thought, I was like, I bet that didn't happen in the countryside so much, uh, but you know, in downtown Athens, yeah, <laughs> that probably went on, but did it happen in the countryside? I don't know. You know? And, and so, you know, and the same thing is true of Rome. I mean, there's no reason to suggest that it, it, it probably didn't happen. But like I said, it was probably, as long as you're talking about small groups of people, uh, it was probably not all the time. No. You know, I mean, it, it, would be, it would be unusual. And of course, they wouldn't be like getting gay married and doing stuff like that. I mean, it, 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 they wouldn't, that, that wouldn't exist in that frame. No, no, no. You know, it, so... I, th- I actually think that's really interesting what you just said about how it's more common in kind of like the cosmopolitan areas. I'd never really yeah. thought I'd never really thought of it like that. And I guess it's because 
back a thousand years ago, and maybe even back fifty years ago, it was I guess it was a dangerous move to to you know to come out and and come on to another man not knowing whether or not it's going to be received well or you're going to get you know a kick in once you leave the area. And and I never really looked at it from that perspective before. Well, actually, I mean, you know, to be honest, I mean, if you've studied the culture, uh, that's why it's really hilarious is because it, where that used to happen a lot was, you know, at, at ports with sailors, <laughs> you yeah. know, back in the day, <laughs> you know, like that, that there, there's, it's well known, like in, in like uh, Jean Genet was a famous French writer who used to write about that, about like getting down with criminals and like it and whatever in the, uh, you know, ports and and so forth in france and and whatever because these guys are traveling all around around the world and, and uh you know they're in there for a minute nobody knows what they're doing they can go back home nobody knows about it it's fine so yeah, uh no. yeah no this is really this is really interesting because this is actually an example when i uh briefly address these subjects uh when i teach about liking for instance um in in, in classes uh um we talk about the fact that like, if you read Icelandic sagas, what you uh, what you'll encounter is um, a lot of uh, uh, you know what you could basically call homophobia. They're really, really uh, in the stories. They're really afraid of being uh, uh, called homosexuals, and uh, that would then you know uh, merit a response that would end up you know with somebody getting killed and. Um, and at the bare at the bare minimum, at least outlaw, right? So, so that tells us then that well, when people are writing down sagas in Iceland, um, they the cultural norm is um, very much anti homosexuals. Sure. Um, and we don't know if that's a trait of post conversion Iceland, so that the Christianity plays a role. We don't know if it's a trait of Iceland as a society in and of itself. That could be a part of the deal as well. And we don't know what, what the, it looked like in uh, Scandinavia, say, in the Viking Age. Um, we have very, very little to go on in general when it comes to evidence of people's uh, um, attitudes to sexuality. Um, except we, of course, know that they, that they practiced heterosexual sex and got married, right? That we know these two things, but that's it. Um, so, so this is really interesting because you know we have uh, in southern Denmark in the Viking Age we have the largest urban community, and I would say to my students, for instance, you know, if there's anything, uh, any place that's going to have a community of, uh, of of people who practice homosexual sex, it's probably going to be such a urban. Uh, "Quote unquote urban here. We're not dealing with you know big cities at all. It's a couple thousand people maximum, right? Um, but that's probably where we would find it, and because that's also where the ships come in. That's where the traders come in. That's where people come and go all the time. Um, so no, it, it makes perfect sense to me. It is interesting though that Iceland is so really incredibly s- scared about talking about it and dealing with it." In, in general, it was it was it's very obvious that Iceland as a society in the Viking Age uh, and and early medieval period is established on a very um, very like uh, single lined idea of what it means to be male, mm-hmm. and and if you break that, uh, then you're screwed. Like th- seriously, <laughs> yeah. That, uh, you lose you lose your possession you lose your position you lose your access to to anything basically mm-hmm. you know it's it is interesting though cuz you know we're talking about uh, like the written and spoken word you know like what you write down about your society versus what actually goes on and you never really know you know because it, like you know it, if no one had been writing down all the other stuff that went on you probably like the main people in society be like, no, 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 no. There's none of that there. There's this great video actually, uh, by this guy who does videos about Ireland, like there are no gays in Ireland. And <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> you know, and they're just, they're singing men, the dancing men. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's hilarious, but, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a, a main line about what people are comfortable to like, this is what we want to promote. And that's always going to be pretty much the same. You know, like obviously you're going to promote things that are in service of the family and and uh, and all that and that, and then uh, you know, 
when it talk when you're talking about like you know like a theater i mean because we're talking about stories right i mean you're talking about the sagas so we're talking about stories um even the way that we write now it, and it, it's like there's so as we talked about when you were on my podcast uh it, it you know there's a lot less information than there is about you know other cultures and uh uh it, I forget what I was gonna say but uh, yeah yeah there's this, oh yeah the other thing that people get this from and this is more the uh, folkish side uh they they get it from uh uh uh, the the Roman who wrote about uh, I'm having a blank on his name. The Roman who wrote Tacitus. about Tacitus. Tacitus, yes. Tacitus yeah. has like one line, like one line in there about that, which could be interpreted. It's like in flagrante delicto or something like that. It's 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 one line that could be interpreted a variety of ways. Mm-hmm. And and then there's the bog people. <laughs> yeah. And from those two things, people have decided that all tribes everywhere in the Germanic world for thousands of years drowned homosexuals in bogs. Yes, yes, and, yeah, that's and, right. and people have come to that conclusion, but the evidence really doesn't there for that. You, know, I mean, it might, maybe in that tribe they did, in that tribe they didn't. We don't know. No, it's, it's exactly, good that you actually, yeah. it's good you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that anyway, Matthias. Because obviously, again, that was the one thing that people kept saying on, you know, on the post. It was, well, they threw them in the bog. People would just comment bog, and it was just kind of like <laughs> over and over. And I'm like, right, okay. So Amy, Amy actually came on. And said about how that was that was wrong, and it's more of a, a kind of a Nazi propaganda. So I want to ask you, Mateus, about that and how much truth there is to it, what there is, and, and I know you'll tell us the the facts. Well, okay, so so the bog bodies are in and of themselves incredibly interesting because we find them all over uh, southern Scandinavia. Denmark, my home country, has so many of them. Um, I mean, this is a kind of a thing that you take your kid to go see uh, <laughs> at the museum. <laughs> that's that's how I was raised with that. Um, maybe so. So I was saying, maybe just give a quick outline on what the bog bodies actually are for people who yeah. are, who aren't familiar. They're human beings who have been killed and put in lakes, and then um, they sink to the bottom. And then uh, sediment layers will basically enclose them in in an oxygen-free environment. Um, the tannins of the uh, sediment layers at the bottom bottom of the bog will uh, um, make sure to preserve your skin and your hair. You know, you can they, they preserve so much of the body. Uh, obviously, the bones will uh, be uh, uh, dissolved uh, because it's very acidous uh, uh, environment. But um, you know. It, so, to some extent, you you know you get such be- such good preservation that you can even analyze the content of these people's stomachs and see what what did they eat before uh, they went into into the bog. Now we have men and women uh, found in uh, it, you know as like just a single person. Some in some cases, a couple of people. Um, and they uh, are from all the way back from the uh, uh, Bronze Age, some of them, as far as I remember, but primarily from the Iron Age. Uh, so, so the first, the first uh, 500 uh, years of the first millennium uh, CE. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, that uh, they actually exhibit very m- many different styles of, uh, of what you could call sacrifice or killing. Some have been... Um, it seems to have been hung and uh, hacked at or stabbed or uh, had some kind of violent death. And others seem, uh, might have been um, uh, um, choked um, by a person um, uh, using a string to, to, to choke them. There's, um, there's one in particular, I can't remember which, you know, what this uh, one is called, but but. That person, which is I think is a female, uh, has her thumb uh, between her index finger and the next finger um, as she's lying there. We we don't know if that's like a symbol or if it's a, a, a ancient way of saying "fuck you" or what whatever it is. <laughs> so is that kind <laughs> of like plenty of like theories? <laughs> is that like where they used to put the balls in your mouth? Is that? I guess so. I. I... <laughs> 
I, I have no idea. And the, the, the thing, the same is the case with like, you know, some go in with items, some go in naked, some have clothes on. And so, it's, so there's like a whole variety when it comes to these, uh, these bog bodies. But uh, yeah, so that single line that Jack was referring to with the, uh, in Tacitus um, is, is what has uh, basically prompted especially uh, uh, Nazi scholars back in the uh, early 20th century uh, to to suggest, oh well, this is of course how they dealt with uh, homosexuals and criminals, and and so on. And I believe the last person to sort of uh, um, uh, echo this theory is uh, Vak Vikanes in his uh, book on uh, Germanic uh, mythology and and worldview, whatever it's called in English. I actually don't know the title uh, that well. Um, I read it back, you know, ages ago, and it was crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, that, that seems to be where, uh, where this uh, comes from. It's, you know, it's an old theory on, on how they might have dealt with the, uh, deviance in society, basically. Do, do they all tend to be executions then? Well, so this is the thing. Some of them definitely look like executions. Some of them look like, uh, maybe just murders and some, some of them look like, uh, sacrifices. And there's, it might actually be the whole range. Mm-hmm. You know, Denmark is a, is, is a country with a lot of water. You know, if you want to get rid of a body, that, that's, that's what you do. You know, you put them up in the, in the local bog over there. I know. You, you, it's, uh, people... it's, it, it wasn't the Vikings. It was the mafia. That's they it. Were the <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it was the mob. <laughs> I often wondered what you'd find if you drained the Thames in London. Right. <laughs> I mean, I bet you would find some uh, some wonderful things and some horrific things as well. Yeah, and see, this is the thing too. You know, from the Viking Age, uh, from some of the city environments, what we find is like a well where you know somebody dumped a body. That that does occur. Um, we, we found a well. Um, I think it, in one of the ring fortresses called the Trallebo uh, fortresses uh, that has a head and a hand. And I think a child's skeleton in it as well. And like, we don't know if that's some kind of like ritualistic act or if it's just, you know, somebody who tried to poison the well or somebody who needed to get rid of some guy's head and their hand, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Well, that's it. It's a completely different time. They didn't have the, the police team in the scuba diving units who could go down there and search the bottom of the lake. So like you say, you could easily just throw somebody in there and, Nobody's going to know unless they float back to the top. Yeah. And, you know, naturally, as, as a mythologist, somebody who researches mythology, I'm thinking, okay, okay, we got a head in a well here. There's got to be some kind of Odin shit going on here. Maybe the hand has something to do with tear. But who knows? Of, of course you've <laughs> yeah. got to think like that. <laughs> so, I mean, moving on, uh, let's, let's jump into kind of like masculinity, masculinity within... Norse mythology. I know you two touched on this a little bit in, in your podcast as, as well, Jack, um, and how what it means to be a man, I guess, in, in the Viking Age. Well, I, I, yeah, I think that's more of a, uh, a Matthias uh, <laughs> area than mine. <laughs> well, you know, uh, what does it mean to be a man in the Viking Age? Obviously, uh, the standard is, is a man who, who, who owns his own house. Um, his own little plot of land uh, has a wife um, and and has children as well. That that I think is is sort of like the standard idea of what a man is. Now, of course, this man also needs to have qualities and and, and skills. Otherwise, he uh, he's not working out. Um, if you go to the poem Rigstula, um, or the what is it called, Rig's Journey in English, where it's it's a late poem, but nonetheless, it gives us some ideas about what uh, what sort of like the middle of the road working class man is like. Uh, he's a man who plows the field and knows all of these uh, um, you know crafts and and knows how to uh, to work the land and build his own house. So I, I feel like that actually sounds very similar to a modern man. You know. Yeah, I mean that's that's always been my uh, thesis is that yeah, there's things that come out of the humanities in universities that uh, 
a, a, you know, a study of masculinities uh, in the plural is it, meaning that they've, they, it's never been the same as their basic theory is that it's never been the same and it's, it's always changing. And so you can't really define masculinity, but uh, if you really go through most of history, you really can. It's it's very it's it's usually very specific, and that's what the way of men was about. I mean, it's they're very specific virtues that that usually have to do with well, you know, what 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 good is this guy in a group of dudes, mm -hmm. you know? And then obviously in a bigger community, then there's things like uh, you know, Matthias was saying as far as like you know, does he does he own a house, you know? And then it's it's all these things of like carrying your own weight, really. Like is he is he on his own or is he dependent? I mean, because that's, you know, like it's traditionally been OK for women to be dependent in most societies because they have children and that's kind of part of their job and that's their contribution. But, uh, you know, for men, if, if a man's not not independent at a certain age, he's he's like a child and they like they can't, you know, the, the, he becomes a burden to everyone around him. And so, yeah, you, you know, everywhere and always is men have been expected to carry their own weight. And uh, to to be to pr be producers instead of you know just consumers, and uh, you know and obviously you know, like I was talking about the book you know like, like strength. And tell me the culture that said strength that the weaker man is the more masculine man. That that's not that's not part of any culture. Uh, you know uh, and uh, you know same things like courage. Uh, the cowardly man he's clearly the more masculine man. I mean that that never happens. <laughs> You know, anywhere in the world, you know, <laughs> like, so, I mean, there's just things that have always been associated with masculinity because they have to do with our primal role as men and, and, uh, that men have always wanted to be, uh, to, to emulate that and, and to be right. seen as a man by other men. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that makes a lot of sense to, to consider, you know, um, the biological makeup of, of humans across the planet is, is pretty similar so so in that sense we would also assume uh, we could also assume that you know there are only so many variations that you get in in the interpretation of of what our biology is male or female uh, is going to be right um yeah no that that makes a lot of sense and i i think that you know we we uh, we, we see this um you know um Expressed very clearly in 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 the the, the, the Scandinavian uh, literature too, this point you were making with um with the the, the man who 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 doesn't you know become uh, independent at some point at a certain age he's supposed to be be independent. I mean there there's, there are themes about this in the folklore. We call them the Ashlad, um, Askelotten in in Norwegian. So this is the guy who hangs out in front of the fire all the time. Hence Ashlad. Um, and the folk tales are about that guy becoming a man. Um, so th th it was obviously a theme that was important to to address in uh, as, as an earlier Scandinavian culture. It, and this theme seems to have existed uh, for for thousands of years, actually, in in, in folk tales. Obviously, the, the latest iterations uh, from the nineteenth century. That's the ones that we have. But um, but yeah, he he does exist as a figure. Um, so that, I mean that that uh, I'm I'm sure I'm mean, obviously not familiar with all kinds of, uh, of folk tales out there, but I'm sure it, it's a it's a theme um, globally. Yeah, I mean coming of age stories, you know, like, like yeah. Yeah, obviously what what does a man do when at what point is become a man? Obviously, there's a huge tradition, and there's tons of writing about uh, you know rituals that that and that that's been a big thing since the 90s as far as like men don't have rituals anymore that take them from being a boy to a man because and and the, the, what I, i've always said about that is the reason we don't is because we don't have a cultural consensus about what being a man is yeah uh, I was, so I was you can't really just... initiate you can't really initiate them into something that you don't know what it is and but whereas before if you had like a small village or you had a, a society that was very uh culturally homogenous um they all have the same expectations of what that guy's supposed to do. And so when you're, you, you have a ritual to be manhunt. Okay. Now you're a man. This is your job. Now this is who, this is what your responsibilities are. This is what your expectations are. You, the boy is dead. Cause they always go through this death process. Like the boy is dead. You know, the man is born and you have to go through this. I mean, and that's, that's the same again, all around the world. I've, the, the book that, uh, you know, one of the books that I was, I've been reading recently that goes to that the initiation process is is from Africa, 
you know, like mm-hmm. they, they study yeah. a lot of tribes in Africa and they do the exact same thing. It's usually like a circumcision ritual or whatever. And they, had, they die and they, but everybody tells their family that they were eaten by monsters and then they rise from the, you know, the, 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 now, now they have to be men, you know, and yeah. it's the same thing always and everywhere. So, yeah. Is that Victor Turner that you've been reading? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you think, and actually are... Mercia, Ale- Mercia Aleata actually wrote a, a, a whole book about initiation as well, which is, yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that masculinity can change through different time periods or what it means to be a man? I guess for for the longest time, you know, we lived in warrior tribes. We were a warrior culture and, you know, we had to be, you had to have that kind of like pinnacle, strong, masculine man, that archetypal figure. Whereas now in modern times, I guess that isn't needed anymore. We're not warrior culture anymore. So does the definition of masculinity change from then to now as I guess you can still be a provider in the sense of, of kind of that masculine provider, but you don't have to be a warrior or a fighter. You could just be a really good computer coder and still provide for your families, you know, more than adequately. Well, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the, the superficial cultural aspects of it always change. I think there's the root of what masculinity is, uh, that it's primal and it's part of being human that, uh, you know, in the same way, I always say like, uh, we talk about evolutionary psychology. Uh, we don't, people have sex, even though they, they know that they don't want to create babies. Right. Yeah. Well, why do you want to have sex? It's not logical. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible waste of resources and time. Uh, you know, but you know, like our, our evolutionary brains still want to do that. You know, even though it, we're, you know, we're, you know, using birth control, we're not having babies, we're doing whatever, but there's something about us that still wants to do that thing. And in the same way, I think masculinity is very much the same way. It's like, there is a part of men that is always there that wants to identify with that warrior thing, because that's what we've been for so long, the hunting and fighting gang. Now, is that all of masculinity? No. And that's, that's why I think, uh, you know, I've talked about it briefly, and this is kind of what my new book is about that, uh, you know, you, you you know, you can break it into different roles. I, in, it, it, we, we had a funny discussion about it, uh, Matthias on my podcast, but the, there are three, you know, either three main gods, like in the, the North Pantheon, you have like, you know, you have your Odin, you have your Thor, which is more like a traditional warrior character, Dumazil's second function. And then you have, uh, you know, like Frey, which, which he said that was maybe tacked on later, but that's okay. Uh, you know, because it, it fits because it fits because most men are not warriors all their lives. Even men who are warriors, if they don't yeah. die, they come home and work at farms, mm-hmm. you know, and they, yeah. they, they get to the process of raising families and taking care of life and perpetuating life. And so that's always been a part of what masculinity is as well. So, you know, is that warrior part always, does it always have to be there? I think, yes. I think that there's something in masculinity and this upsets people, but there's something in masculinity that is always going to be attached to a threat of violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, There it's there. It has to, it has to be there. Otherwise you're talking about something else then. But are there many other aspects of masculinity? Absolutely. Do you think that warrior side could morph in modern day into something other than necessarily violence? It could just be maybe that you are the more hungry in your situation and you just want to get ahead of the others. It doesn't have to necessarily be a violent way. It could be you in the office space, you know, you, you've got that drive to be the best and, and get ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like the, the other circles that I run in uh, that I really actually go in, you know, like the men's uh, circles, obviously there's the, like the being alpha thing. And uh, you know, obviously they're not talking about chopping heads off. They're talking about like, you know, doing what you have to do and, and being hungry for success and all that kind of thing. And, and obviously, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where aggression is channeled into. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's bad to deny where the root of it comes from, mm-hmm. but obviously we can't all be warriors. Uh, you know, even in, in even in the, the scariest society, everybody's not a warrior. And uh, certainly in this one, uh, you know, we, that, that's just a job that also men still do there are still warriors and police. That is a job that men still do. It's not like it's gone away. It's just, we farm it out to a very small percentage of men, Mm -hmm. which may grow and change at different times, depending on what's going on in the world. So, I I mean, a lot more men may be in a position where they have to worry about things that they didn't have to worry about in, uh, in the near, in the very near future. So, 
uh, it's a mistake to say that we're going to evolve away from it and into a completely protected species because maybe that won't happen. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we've been, we've stayed this, we've stayed a very similar way for a very long time because things don't always work out the way people want them to, you know? So, I mean, that's, that, that's one of the interesting things when it comes to humans. Uh, it seems like the, the biggest population control is actually a war. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we don't have that many predators that actually really threaten us in, in terms of our existence. Uh, usually, you know, historically, we've seen when humans move into to an area uh, where there haven't been humans living for at least a while, um, all the big animals die especially the apex predators they just disappear um and you know the the rocky mountains where i'm sitting is like one of the last places where you still have some uh, apex predators in sort of what we could call the western world right um obviously there there's still jungles and stuff out there but um but yeah and you see uh, as as we are getting closer and closer to um uh, the uh, uh, the mountains here, um, these an- uh, these larger animals, they're they're getting more and more cramped too, um, because we humans we are the ones who are killing them off. Have you, <laughs> in one way or another, <laughs> have you read the book Sapiens? Is that have you ever? Uh, are you asking me or? It, but either of you. Uh, I, I flipped through it. Yeah. So I would say there's an interesting theory in that about why humans tend to do what we do. And it's to do with how we evolved so rapidly from being kind of a a mediocre species that nobody really worried about, and something <laughs> some well that's that's how kind of how they describe it, and then some <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. something along the line propelled us to the top, but nature mm-hmm. didn't have time to counteract it and put a predator in place to keep us in check. So whereas obviously everything else has something that will keep it in its place. Whereas we went to the top, but because we rose so rapidly, there's like an innate feeling within humans where we're too worried that we're going to go back to being this mediocre species. So we kind of subconsciously destroy everything else. Um, And I thought, I thought, I thought it was a really interesting theory kind of that came out of the book. Well, you know, when the aliens come, you know, then the aliens come, then there, there will be the mediocre species again. That's what we're trying, we're trying to get <laughs> well, the technology there to fight the aliens. You know, like, you know, I don't know. Didn't, didn't they just land in New Jersey? I, I think I saw something about that. <laughs> is, is that, I mean, is it that month now? You know, like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> no, I think, I think the newest was that there's some species on, is it Jupiter or something oh, they've, they've seen some venus. sort of bac- yeah, venus. venus is it about some yeah, sort of yeah. bacteria so that's that's yeah. the new one to scare everybody okay. yeah of course but no i mean if we go back to this, uh, this notion that basically the only thing that really uh keeps our populations in in, in check is us attacking ourselves as human mm-hmm. beings right um that's really interesting to consider that uh that there is if there is a base of like a, I don't know if it's a need or it's a biological drive towards violence. I mean, mm-hmm. um, think about that for a second. If if mm-hmm. if uh, our species harbors that in itself, and I think we see in general a lot of examples of this across the world. Right? We, you know, as human beings, we find some random excuse to 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 start antagonizing another group. Like whether it's a, a religion or race or or, or, or the, the fact that they just live right over there on the other side of the hill, right? I mean, anybody who, who has uh, lived in a small town uh, knows how you just hate the, the people from that other small town right over there. They suck. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's, where, <laughs> that's where you go to pick fights at the bar and that kind of stuff. Tends, right? to, be sport, yeah, yeah. tends to be sport based. <laughs> yeah, sports, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it does seem like there's something inherent in, in our uh, biology that drives us towards that kind of stuff, like basic violence, right? But Well, I mean... Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Um, please oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's pretty normal to a lot of species, really. I mean, to, mm-hmm. to you know, like, I mean, it's basic tribalism. You know, but uh, I mean, my dogs, once I got two dogs, they packed up and now they're mean to other dogs. You know, like Mm -hmm. it's humans do that, too. Uh, We get into groups and and it's very normal to our psychology 
uh, because you know there's that there's that theory uh, uh, there's Dunbar's number I think is what it's called. Uh, there's that theory that we can't really have meaningful relationships beyond like 150. And so everything gets really abstract and it becomes really hard to, to, you know, because you, you can't, you can't care about it. And that's the po- a point that I've made that I get in trouble for, but uh, I, it's true. You, you can't actually care about everybody in the world. Like that's impossible. I can't even, I really can't even visualize no. anything beyond like a football stadium. <clears throat> and so like, you know, we do tend to like prefer, groups of like-minded people, you know, and uh, you can see that, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm moving away from Portland because it is so the, it's so culturally homogenous. Uh, it's actually so culturally homogenous that everyone there basically thinks that everybody else believes the same thing. And they, they're mm. in a, this little bubble and they, they don't like every, they don't like even like going out into the country. They start judging people out in the country. Like, Oh, you know, like all these people are bad, you know, whatever. Uh, they live in this space where everybody has the exact same opinion about things. And, and then they don't like the rest of the world. And, and you can see that happening in a lot of major cities and, and so forth. And, and, and so it's, it's not like something that only happens on one side. It's not that it only happen it, it, it happens everywhere. People are tribal. And uh, mm-hmm. I think it's, I think, uh, yeah, actually you mentioned to me uh, about uh, Sebastian Younger's uh, uh, book, Tribe, mm-hmm. I think we, mm-hmm. you know, in our, in our, we were discussing it because he, he wrote about that a little bit. I, my take on his book is basically that it was a little bit uh, uh, milk toast. Uh, <laughs> that uh, he, uh, he, he basically just said, we should all be nicer to each other. After, after sh- saying that we really are a tribal species, mm-hmm. we're like, well, we should all be nicer to each other. That really doesn't solve the problem that we're talking about. No. <laughs> uh, and, and, and humans are always going to be tribal. And that's why I personally, I've, I've always said smaller governments are better governments. Smaller countries are better countries. You know, like let small groups of people self. I mean, that was kind of the original idea of America. Then it just got big and out of control is self-determination. You know, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, like really they were supposed to have 13 colonies that were pretty much had their own say. And I, I'm reading the biography of George Washington and, and he's going up into the north with the, uh, you know, like the Massachusetts and all these like, like, like they don't like the guys from Massachusetts. The guys from Virginia hate the guys from Massachusetts. And like they're they're having all kinds of cultural problems there. And that's always been the way it is. And so I think it's. I think that's the way the world is. And, and, uh, you know, like Dr. Strangelove, we should stop worrying and learn, learn to love the bomb. Like we, that, that we should learn to love. I mean, this is what we are. And so the best thing to do, I think is to let people self-determinate instead, instead of trying to set policy for, for like a continent, you know, <laughs> you know, like that's, I, I think because people feel unimportant, mm-hmm. You know, like mm. they don't feel like they're being heard and they don't, they feel like their culture is being missed and they don't feel like they can develop beyond that. But we have this idea that we have to impose the exact same values across the entire world all the time. You know, like, let's just mm. let, let people, let people be what it is. Like, you know, like let the South be the South. The South is the South, you know, like let's, you know, like, uh, I mean, you know, in the UK, you guys have had countries that have been trying to break apart, break off for forever. <laughs> they've been trying, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like they've, 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 they just let us be us and let us do our own thing. And, uh, you know, there's this desire to keep everybody packed together. Mm-hmm. And I just let, let these groups go, let them self-determine and, uh, let them create their own cultures. And maybe you don't like their culture or maybe you'll like that culture better. I always thought if Texas broke away, I would just move there. Uh, you know, <laughs> like it's, you know, like that sounds great. I'm moving to Texas. Uh, you know, but you know, it, it's, and there's so many little movements of, of people in America that are trying to do that, but they just never get any traction because there's so much money. But in Europe, I think there's actually more, uh, ability for those groups to kind of separate and, 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 you know, make solutions. And actually one of the reasons, I guess I'm on a tangent now, but uh, one of the reasons why it's such a good thing. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the virus thing, uh, that, you know, people, it's like everybody handled it differently. Mm -hmm. Mm. And if you, if you have completely open borders and you have nowhere, you can lock anything down, you have a problem, you know, like you, if, if you have, Hey, this group's going to try it this way and this group's going to try it this way. And over time you're going to be like, well, they handled it better over there, you know, like, so let's do that next time, you know, but if you have everybody doing the same blanket solution, you know, you don't, you don't learn anything, you know, because it's, it's just like, no one will ever admit that they were wrong. So like, right. uh, you know, like, 
you know, it, different people with different solutions trying different things. I mean, that's what that's what human cultures are, and that's why it's cool. I want to travel to different countries where they're different. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But but then let me ask you a question. What about collaborations? Then you know, obviously, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a Russia. Let's if we look at Russia. Russia is a federation of of, of uh, in principle autonomous uh, uh, republics, and and then Russia um, mm-hmm. as its own thing, right? And um, that seems at least I I know very little about Russia actually, but it seems from the outside that it's a very cohesive unit. Then you have mm-hmm. Europe, all of these small states, right? The only the only way that Europe is uh, is managing their relationship to Russia and Russia's interests is uh, mm-hmm. is through collaboration in in the mm-hmm. EU system. Um, and it you know uh, there, there's a lot of things to say about EU as a as an entity, whether or not you like, <laughs> you like it. That's that's another discussion. But but that's that's a way that the you know collaboration can function, right? The, sure. the U.S. Is, is in principle the same, uh, a, a union of states uh, that are then supposed to collaborate, right? But what we have here in the U.S. is a, is a much broader, uh, more hands-on federal government than than the collaborative federal government or whatever you want to call the EU system, right? And then you have the, the um, I assume, I consider it more hierarchical federation of russia right so it kind of seems like in order to to survive and not be gobbled up by some some entity some bigger entity right um you're gonna have to try to submit somewhere uh look at norway norway is not part of the eu norway basically follows eu law because otherwise they couldn't uh, trade and speaking to our poor friend over here in, in, in Brexit UK, uh, <laughs> that's really the problem that the UK has right now. Mm-hmm. If they want to trade with, with the EU, they're going to have to follow EU law. And that's what they didn't want to do in the first place, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Which may be coercive. I don't know if that's, the, like, that's, what, that's a control thing or not. You know, like uh, whether or not, because you, know, you could trade with, they could trade with Africa, right? <laughs> they could trade with anyone well, yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's just a matter of like how much do you want to like, I, who knows? Because obviously they want that thing to, to be big. But I this yeah. is beyond my scope of expertise, so I should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, but I was just thinking about this, this, sort of this subject of like, oh, yeah, the, the, this more tribalist world seems more appealing. But then what happens when, you know, say these 50 tribes over here decide that they're going to become the United States of America and then go gobble up everything else, right? Then is it possible to maintain any form of? Well, actually, I can tell like uh, in the way of men, there's a theory called, that comes from a book called Demonic Males. And, and it, it's just a generally understood theory, I think, in anthropology or whatever uh, with uh, our species is that we are a party gang species. Uh, in the sense is that we feel most comfortable in small groups, but if there's a superordinate threat, we'll band together. And then as soon as the mm. threat goes away, we'll break it back up into like smaller groups because that's actually how we feel more comfortable because you know, everybody, you speak the same language, you'd have the, you know, you have the, the, that familiarity. That's good. But if there is a superordinate threat, we all band together. And that's, you saw that op- obviously that happened in world war two. You have access and allies, you know, like, mm-hmm. and then they break back up into what they are. And, mm. you know, I think, so I think that there's room to, it doesn't always have to be one forever. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like if, if Russia decided it wanted to be an aggressor, then obviously like the EU and probably the United States would have to get together and be like, let's make some boundaries and, uh, you know, figure that out. And then obviously they would want to go back to self-determination because obviously, you know, people in the EU wouldn't want the United States running them. Mm-hmm. You know, right. and, yeah. and so like they wanted to go back to like, hey, I want the people near me making the decisions about my life, and that's been right. a most frustrating thing about a lot of things that have gone around uh, on around the world right now is that you you get a situation where like you have people that aren't near you at all making decisions about your life that aren't relevant to even your reality, and mm. that's what I think self determination is so important. Like I mean, like I said, I lived in a town where I think the, like three people have died of COVID. Uh, yeah. like in the entire, since it started, you know? And, and so, it, but you know, same policies get put here that they get put in a big city. 
you know, right. and so you get, you know, like there's people get mad when they don't have an ability to self govern. And yeah. so I think that that's, that's the, that's the thing that you have to go back to. I think after you band together to fight the big enemy, you got to break mm-hmm. up into like smaller pieces again. That's, that's something okay, I yeah. definitely agree with. I, I said quite a few times that I would rather localize power and, and people who are the people who are passing judgment and, and they're in control should be closer to the people that they're governing. Because I mean, you've got Europe that is 700 million people and it's impossible to, to put laws in place that are going to be perfect for every single person. I mean, there's three of us on this chat and I'm sure we'll agree on some stuff and there'll be other stuff that we'll absolutely disagree. So it would be impossible probably for us three to have a blanket rule of, of rules that we're all happy by. So when you start doing it to like millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, my personal feeling is that it doesn't work. And I think it should be, you know, power should be much more localized. You know, as a Dane, this is like uh, this is this is music to my ears. Um, <laughs> that's pre- pretty much what my country is built on: uh, local government, um, and and also it was like what you would call grassroots uh, organizations, right? So you have people with special interests over here. They all come together, and then they form a uh, organization, a collective, basically um, with a democratic structure. They they. Uh, elect a, uh, a president or whatever you want to call it, right? And that can be everything from you know people who want to uh, protect uh, environment over here, or people who um, are into model trains, or a of uh, a, a badminton club, or a you know martial arts club. It's the, it's the same basic structure, right? And those uh, groups, they on different levels, uh, in uh, to the extent that they need to. I mean, some of them have political ideas and 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 aims, right? So they they work together with local government, right? You have um, people electing uh, city council officials and um, to an extent county officials. We kind of got we got rid of that, and then of course the you know the national parliament, right? So so there's like a, a, a tiered um, sort of democratic system where you can start at the very you know bottom with the people who are uh locally involved with something and then all the way up through uh have collaboration in in different ways um a thing that i'm seeing here in the us when it comes to this is it's, people seem a little lost with these kinds of things people don't have a lot of things that that connects them and i i would say it's probably because of this you know uh superstructure that is uh well work Eat, sleep, fuck, die, right? Yeah. Buy a Ford, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's that's all it is, right? <laughs> um, so, so it's like you you live you live in a little suburban house, but you don't necessarily have connections uh, and community around you um, when you do that. Um, and um, and yeah, that that of course then detaches you from a, a from from meaningful engagement with uh, you know. For instance, local uh, politics. And there are some places that, that this happens, of course, that there are people who do that kind of stuff. But there's also so many people moving in and out of areas and, and territories in the U.S. that I think it becomes difficult to maintain a cohesive structure for people, our local community. Yeah, we're, we're remo- very mobile. And I, and I, uh, I mean, I've noticed this a little bit because I got just, just a touch you know, involved in local politics out here for a minute uh, and, and just got a sense, got to see what was going on. And uh, this is a small enough area that we know all the people in town who are on the other side, <laughs> you know, like where they're like, they all know each other and they're like, I know what restaurant so-and-so goes to and I know what this is. And so they all know what's going on. And so there is some sense that uh, they're all there together, but there is, especially right now, unfortunately, we all, you know, like, the world as it was like a year ago is not even what we're talking about anymore. Mm. You know, was we, and so there's like mass migrations happening all around the country right now. And so like, uh, you know, people are going to be a lot less grounded in their community because everybody's going to be new, you know, because yeah. every, like everybody's leaving New York and going everywhere and everybody's leaving California and mm. going everywhere. And I'm leaving the small town and going to Utah and, uh, you know, like, so there's gonna, there's a big migration happening right now. So we'll see what happens, you know, in, in a few years. But uh, actually, to, to 
to say it'll probably stay as much the same uh, as your point of like work, sleep, whatever. Uh, <laughs> the push really is to for everybody to work from home. Yeah. And so that, that, I mean, as adults, most of the friends we make are through our jobs. You know, like that's the easiest way to make friends because you spend the most amount of time with people and then you're like, well, Bob's a jerk. I don't want to hang out with Bob. <laughs> but uh, then you're like, but but then, you know, uh, Rick over here, he does, you know, he's pretty cool. And, and so you get a sense of who people are and that's how you, you, you make friends as, as an adult many times. And and uh, all these people, you know, sitting at home in their computers, you know, have a lot less opportunity, I think, to really connect with the people yeah. who are close to them. They're connecting to somebody who's in like Taiwan or like whatever through Zoom meetings and all that. Whereas they, they may not know, even though they're the person in the apartment next door. Yeah. Or the house next door or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think that's true um, uh, for, for the most part. Uh, for, for me personally, in, in I live in a small enough town too, that we actually uh, uh, interact with one another um so so that's that's kind of nice uh <laughs> um but but yeah no this is definitely the like how it is in you know the bigger cities right mm -hmm. um but yeah okay so i want to ask you uh, jack then um what about the individual what can what can the individual person do here um to uh, find rituals for their lives uh, to to become a, a a functional man who who is of a healthy mind and doesn't you know for instance get uh, uh, bogged up in you know um, in that aggression that that seems to be part of our biology. Um, you know, well, I I deal with men, so I don't deal with what women should do ever because uh, that keeps me out of trouble, <laughs> more trouble anyway. Uh, but, uh, as, as far as what, you know, men should do always, I, I do think that we need other men, uh, because I think that that helps us develop as men, but, uh, that can be in a productive way or a non-productive way. And, uh, you know, to develop as an individual, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're going out and you're learning more skills and you're testing yourselves in different ways and whether, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, learning something new. Uh, I do think that for men, I think that there, there needs to be an aggression part and maybe they would, they would, uh, make less stupid, aggressive comments online if they maybe took some martial arts and got that out of the system. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, like maybe, uh, you know, find a more, uh, positive outlet for that, uh, that's, you know, more functional and have that experience with, with other men and so forth. And, and I think that that's, that is you as an individual making a decision to go do that, you know, but as, as far as for finding rituals for yourself and for your home and or whatever, I mean, that's, that's good too. You know, like, you, you know, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, obviously you have to set up your own personal life in whatever way that you want, decide what you really want to do in life and what your contribution to the world is going to be. Uh, but um, you know, it, it, I think that, I think that we are very social animals. So we have to seek out each other and it's just a matter of who you're seeking out. Like they always say, like you're some of the people who you surround yourself with. And if you're angry and you go out and hang out with 10 angry dudes, I bet you're going to find some more stuff to be angry about. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, like that's, or, or they just, or, or men, and I've had this a lot. Uh, men, men seek each other out just so they can talk, finally talk about the things that they're angry about. You know, mm. like they had to be politically correct all the time. And then they, they want to find some guys that are like, Oh, this is some bullshit, yeah. isn't it? You know, and then and then have the big talk about like everything they're mad about and get it out. And so maybe that's just catharsis uh, for mm -hmm. them. You know, you know, maybe that's just cathartic. But I don't think that's positive. I think I think that it, it, you you know, if you're seeking out other people who are, you know, moving in a positive direction, uh, they're going to influence you in that way. I mean, that's one that's one of the reasons why I'm moving. I'm like, I know some people in Salt Lake City who are movers and shakers who are getting things done, who are like. Uh, you know, going to push me in a, in a, in a way and make, you know, make me th see the world in a different way and, 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 uh, make me think and make me push myself a little bit. And, uh, so that's, that's what I want to, that's what I, I think everybody needs that, you know, you know, you know, mm. surround yourself with those kind of people. It's, fu it's funny that you mentioned about arguing online. I mean, I, I grew up playing rugby my entire life from, you know, from 14 up until I think I retired at like 30 
and I always got aggression out playing rugby. You know, it's a it is I guess quote unquote a masculine sport. You know, it's a, you get a, you definitely get aggression out. You have a you have the occasional fight, and it it is what it is. But when I stopped playing, I definitely found myself having more and more online quote debates and getting into just stupid little arguments. And it wasn't until then I started doing like jujitsu, mixed martial arts, Muay Thai, where I found another outlet for that aggression that I then kind of calmed down a little bit again and stopped being such such a dick online. I mean, I'm still occasionally <laughs> a dick online, but yeah, yeah. I mean, me, I have my moments, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's I it, it it doesn't do anything. And so, yeah, I think if you're if you have something else going on. And I always say people who are making angry comments online, I always imagine them standing in line at like, like the DMV or something. Like I always imagine them like being someplace they don't ha- want to be, being bored and wasting time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that is a lot of where that comes from. And you know what? If you're busy and you're doing stuff that you care about and you're excited about, you're not online making stupid comments. You know, like you're you're, <laughs> you're you know you're that invested is, in some a other very thing. good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Mateus, I mean, we've we've kind of gone way off topic from the, the Viking age. I mean, not something that's... about Vikings. Yeah, yeah. Quick, <laughs> quick, throw something in there, um, Mateus. I guess yeah, yeah. Um, the the handbook, I guess, maybe to being a man is Havamal and the way they go through mm-hmm. the different lessons. I don't know if you want to just touch on that and what that what that kind of shows us to being. I'm showing us about masculinity in the Viking age. Yeah, so so some of the sort of like core aspects of being a, a good man is uh, to be um, well self reliant, as we have seen already. Uh, this I think uh, one of the stances says something like, uh, uh, you know, it, the man who who's a beggar. Uh, who, has a crying heart or something like that. So it's like, it's, it's, that's a very central aspect that, that you want to have your own, uh, you know, your own foundation for, for, for income and food, right? Uh, you want to have your own house, even, even if it's got holes in the roof, it says, uh, aside from that, a, a, a responsible man, a man who, who takes responsibility for himself and for his surroundings. That's something that we're seeing a lot. Um, uh, Halvamal uh, talks a lot about not getting too drunk at parties. <laughs> That's a thing. Says Don't me as drunk. I was just drinking a beer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're English. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so so that's that's a thing um, that's that's really important to uh, to to keep yourself in check, keep your um, um, keep your anger in check as well. It's also something that we're seeing mentioned. Um, I, I think. It's a little cryptic to stanza, but but one of the stanzas talks about how um, you know there there can be like this strong fire of friendship between people, then all of a sudden it cools down and people become dicks to each other. Um, that's that's a a, a a thing that we're focusing on a lot. Uh, generosity is another one. Uh, a man who's generous is is a more respectable man than the one who. Uh, uh, who never gives out anything, but in turn, also a man who does not accept gifts is an idiot. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's another thing that uh, that that uh, Odin basically is pointing out here. Um, uh, finally, a, a man who uh, wants uh, to steal another man's property has to get up early. That is something that, that Odin also tells us, and and and. You have to be friends to your friends and don't be friends to your friends' enemies. So there you have the stress on the community um, and the community of men, I would say. Um, that's that's who he's talking to in, in this, this poem, right? Um, loyalty, courage, those, those are pretty standard, I would say, pretty standard ideas of what, what makes a man. It's fascinating um, how many are still so relatable today to say that they were mm-hmm. written so long ago. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the thing. Uh, uh, this is one of the things I personally find fascinating about, you know, Viking Age, pre-Christian culture, 
uh, it is uh, it appeals to exactly the kind of person that I am today. You know, like it, it it is applicable in my my daily life. Um, it also says some uh, somewhere in Hawamal it says don't argue with fools, right? That's that's like written for Facebook. Absolutely, I, I remind about- myself of that all the time. I have started with I had started comments, and then I remember that one. Right, like not right, th- not three words with a lesser man. Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I definitely. Yeah, that, that's, think uh, that, that's that's kept me out of a lot of trouble because it does, and because they ba- it basically says like they'll come back and beat you at your game, which is another quote about that. That's more modern, but uh, you know, like the, uh, you know, they'll beat you with experience or something. Yeah, but, uh, you know, they uh, uh, and and another one that's made for uh, you know online uh discussion really is there are a lot of passages i can't quote one specifically but there are a lot of passages about like you know being a fool who everybody everybody you think everybody's laughing at with you and they're laughing at you yeah yeah you know, and there, <laughs> there's a lot of that in there you know like yeah. so you know like like the, the you know foolish man thinks everybody's laughing with him but they're, they're really not you know like they're yeah. they're actually like yeah playing him no that's true <laughs> there's also you know don't 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 show up to a party then sit there and stare at people and talk about them and la la la, la. you know uh you know be be happy uh be uh, be courteous be be friendly be nice uh, drink a little bit and then go home and sleep you know that that's yeah. you know modesty is is a is an important virtue as well and that, that also means modesty with like uh, who you are as a person. Um, don't give too much of yourself either. And uh, care about your reputation. Right? There are two stanzas about that. Uh, what was it? 76 and, and 75 and 76. Somewhere around there. Um, those are the ones with like uh, you know, that you will die and your cattle will die and your hammer will die, all that stuff. Right, right. If they end with, you know, what the one thing that does not die is the judgment that people have over the dead man. Mm-hmm. So that basically means, you know, shit people are going to talk about when you're dead, right? That's what you need to right. care about. What kind of yeah. legacy am I leaving behind? It feels like a lot of it is is just do things in moderation, which is, I guess... You know, you can live your life by that now. It's just enjoy yourself, but just don't go too excessive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's basic old man advice. You know, it's like dad <laughs> advice. Uh, you know, like hey, like, like uh, you know, like maybe you should not get so drunk at parties, son. Yeah, you know, yeah. like like, like maybe, maybe stop running your mouth around a whole bunch of people because you're gonna get yourself in, tr- in fights. Trust me, I've been there. You know, like you know, like that's. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, it's a lot of like, you know, guy, like an older warrior giving a younger warrior advice or whatever, you know, like uh, don't get these stupid situations because this is what happens. You know, I know you think it's a good idea. You know, I know you think a lot of meat is good, but maybe it's better in moderation. You know, it's not as good as men think, I think is one of the uh, mm -hmm. lines from it. And obviously the uh, 20 year old knows best. Right. Always. (laughs) Always. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Of course. Um, one thing I do remember from from your podcast together was Mateus. You were mentioning about how sort of it was. I, I guess you have this idea of Vikings as being very bloodthirsty, and if somebody wronged them, you would go around their house and cut you know cut them down and kill the family, and that was that. Whereas I, I know you mentioned on yours, Jack, the how that wasn't necessarily the case. That it was more thoughtful than that, and you know something may go wrong and you may go home and sit and think about it for 12 months and then come back and have your revenge. Yeah. That's typically how it goes in the sagas. Uh, you know, somebody offends someone else uh, to the extent that this legally uh, would merit that uh, the person responded by killing uh, either the person that had offended them or somebody from their family. And yeah, the next thing that happens is like, you know, say, say you're out, um, you know, this is, you're, you're out plowing or, or harvesting uh, hay in the commons, all of you from, from the same area, right? You have to, there's like the commons where everybody can harvest hay and somebody ends up insulting someone else. Now, instead of that necessarily turning into a fight right there on the spot, um, the, the, the saga will typically describe it as like he looked sternly at him or something like that. And then he left. 
And then, you know, six months later, somebody from that family gets killed. All of a sudden. <laughs> and that's, that's how these things uh, often uh, play out in the saga literature. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things um, that lies behind this uh, is probably that, the, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the transgression has been done. Um, the question is what, is, what is going to be the response? And the response, if you want to maintain your position in this type of society, will have to be violence. Otherwise, um, I mean, you can take it to court, but then you're going to have to rely on, um, uh, first of all, taking it to court would be once a year, but that would be possible. Right? But um, you will also have to rely on popularity. Like basically, uh, popularity and alliances between the different families, um, and that can be tricky uh, in and of itself. But if you have the law on your side, then it is uh, your uh, your right to then go kill somebody from from that other family, um, not necessarily the perpetrator. Now that all ties into um, a system of status, so. Um, an offense and how offensive it is is based off of like the, the, the status that the, each family holds. Um, so if you're if the family that uh, the person that is offended or being uh, um, uh, targeted by some kind of offense um, comes from a higher status family, then then there's a real problem. Like, then it's a serious problem, right? But if it's a lower status family, then then it's not actually a problem. Uh, and then he just needs to shut up and go home. Um, but then, you know, you also have to measure out the correct response. Because, like, if you, if the person from the other family is the highest standing individual, and you then go kill that one, then you have a whole civil war on your hand. Mm -hmm. But if you go kill a slave, on the other hand, then you just basically uh, messed with some of their property. If you kill a lower-ranking member of the family, then uh, it might be able to be settled with a um, with a whale guild uh, scenario, right? So like, there, there are all of these things that you need to measure out and really, really be careful what you do because you know each response uh, or each uh, each each action has a consequence mm -hmm. or a response that will come back right in your face at some point. And that's also kind of like the, the, the basic morale of any saga um, or, or moral, what do you call it? Morality. Um, what, what is that word? Yeah. Sorry. Moral, moral yes. is the right one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was, I was using it in the uh, version of morale. So as in, you know, mm. you know the morale among soldiers. Because I'm foreign. Okay, yeah. yeah but anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We should probably cut that part. <laughs> but yeah, the point is simply that, that that's how sagas usually uh, play out. That's what they want to tell you, that you have to really think about how you respond but, to uh, these kinds of transgressions. Yeah, when, when I was listening to that, I thought I was thinking about how that kind of shows to being a man and how it's not necessarily... You, you have to respond, but you have to respond the correct way. You can't just act on impulse and pure hot-headed nature and you know kill the first person in front of you you have to go home sit think and then come back with a response but like you say it can't be too much of a response that is then going to bring more negative impact on you it's got to be just the right amount of response where you don't lose face but you've also got your own back for the for the original act so there's a you know there's a lot of layers to it rather than kind of mm -hmm. You've, you know, you've killed so and so, so I'm going to come back with instant revenge. Yeah, balance all the time, right? And make sure you got your the backup from your community too. Um, you, you, as a as a single man, if you just go out there and then respond without having checked with uh, uh, with the rest of your family and and other people who are important in terms of alliances, then you're a fool. Then you're a real idiot. <laughs> because that means then you know if if you haven't uh cleared with uh, somebody who's say your your family is uh, very good friends with another family that is higher ranking or has more politics or or something like that happening and you haven't cleared with them 
before you go and, and kill this guy, there could be something that you didn't know about that would all of a sudden impact your relationship to that uh, other family. And also then your standing in society. So yeah, it's a it's a tricky, very tricky uh, a situation to, 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 you know, exact revenge. And you never just want to do it. Like, you want to think about it first. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, having been in a, in a small tribe uh, for a bit myself, uh, it, it all this, uh, you know, we think of politics as being on a national scale, you know, on this big, like, you know, people in big buildings and whatever. But politics is like 10 people. <laughs> you know, you get 10, 20 people and you're like, well... I, these three people are on my side. These four people are on my side. Da, 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 da. If I come here and say this thing da, 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 about this guy who's pissing me off, then I have to deal with those people and that people. And his wife is going to come over to my wife. Da, da, da. You know, mm-hmm. you got, I mean, politics is everywhere, you know, like, like in tribal groups. And I think that's just an example of like how tough politics can be, even with small groups of people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we haven't got as far as I was hoping we would do this episode, but I'm gonna have to wrap this one up just for the fact that it's getting it's getting quite late here. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, whilst we're on the topic of sort of masculinity, I guess the reason why I probably could do with the rest is that I'm going up to Scotland to lift a bunch of the ma- the original manhood stones, which I guess is oh, cool. kind of one of the the original ways that they used to test, like we were saying before, you come in of age and mm-hmm. it's here's a big rock, pick it up. <laughs> Can you pick it up? Yeah. <laughs> you're, a, you know, you're now a man. So, you know, nice. me, me and a couple of friends, we're going to go up and, and test ourselves against a, a bunch of these. So I need to make sure I get my beauty sleep. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got it. Um, I mean, quickly, this is the, the, the first podcast that we've we've recorded video-wise because um, we've just started our, our Patreon, Matthias, um, it's literally Patreon forward slash Nordic, uh, Nordic mythology. And yeah, I mean, you can get on, there's a bunch of cool stuff that you can get for very little money. You know, we're going to do video episodes, bonus episodes, that kind of thing. So just check that out if you get them in just to help support us and we can get some better equipment. So I don't look quite as tired and shit. That's why I did my beard and sorted my hair out today. I tried to make an effort. <laughs> So I mean, apparently, yeah. No, I, I I also did my makeup and all that stuff. <laughs> I did I did tell you to. I mean, apparently, I can't sit here and just do the podcast in my pants anymore. No. <laughs> so no, um, Jack, thank you very much for for spending the time. Thank you for for coming on. Let people, I mean, just let people know where they can find you, find your books, for anything you want to plug, shout out, what you're working on. Cool. Yeah. My my books are on Amazon. Uh, uh, you know, the main one is the way of men. That's where you start. Uh, my website is jack-donovan.com and, uh, I'm mostly uh, distribute things through Instagram. So my Instagram is at start the world. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, hopefully people will listen to this and give you a a fair shake and, and hopefully we can change a few, a few opinions of the people have got. Yeah, or not. Whatever. (laughs) Perfect. That's a perfect way to end it. All right. right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.